thank you all. Uh, this is the VCU Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, today is December 9, 2021. Just a couple of housekeeping items. We are still virtual, so uh, please utilize the chat function, the Q&A, and raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. If you have any questions about technical assistance, you can message uh, Thomas Prine separately, and we will follow up with you all to reconnect with audio. Uh, attendance is still um, the QR code on the screen, as well as the text code will be reposted towards the end of the lecture if you uh, miss it here in the beginning. But um, thank you all for joining, appreciate it. And I know many of you all are in the middle of the epic transition. And so thank you for taking some time out of your day today to, to listen to our speaker. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today's Grand Round series is sponsored by the Division of Nephrology here at VCU. Um, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Uh, Mohatije. Uh, she is from Duke University in the Division of Nephrology. She's going to talk to us today about racism and kidney health, turning equity into a reality. Uh, should be a good discussion. A little bit about Dr. Mohatage. Uh, she is a nephrologist and medical instructor in the Division of Nephrology at Duke University. She received her BA in Public Policy and Health Policy Certificate from Duke University in 2016, where she was a Robertson Scholar. She then earned an MPH in Health Policy and Health Education from the UNC Healings School of Public, Global Public Health and a medical degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, followed by her internal medicine and nephrology training at Duke. She now works under the uh, mentorship of Dr. Ebony Bolware uh, to engage in patient and community-centered, inequity-focused research around the impact of sociostructural factors on kidney health and kidney transplantation. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that. And um, glad you had some time this morning to meet with some of our uh, faculty members. So thank you so much. We'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very generous invitation. It's really an honor to be able to join you all for Grand Rounds uh, today. And I'm hoping to showcase a bit of how really the kidney world has helped all of us, I think, think more clearly about how racism can influence health. So I'll be sharing some examples of that, specifically uh, focusing on what is essential to know about race and how it's been embedded into medical pedagogy, how key issues in nephrology have really served as a platform for understanding this. I wanna talk about how kidney health disparities really do uh, in many ways reflect structural racism and other major uh, structural inequities. Um, I'll talk a bit about the harms of race essentialism and how this has applied to our national conversations about the race coefficient and kidney function estimation equations. And then finally, leave us with some thoughts about how we might achieve kidney health equity. Uh, as you all know, in the United States, a national reckoning with racism amplified by COVID-19 and gross inequities overall in people's health and resources galvanized our nephrology communities to have more conversations about kidney health inequity and the role of our medical practices in producing those. Multiple articles highlighted here uh, demonstrate the role of racism as a root cause of disparities in kidney health outcomes and propelled us to think more clearly about how we can use this knowledge to improve the lives of our patients. And our conversations about racialized medical practices specifically and clinical algorithms and the lessons that we need to learn from this have been especially salient in nephrology. The US national media highlighted multiple stories, including that of Jordan Crowley last year. So Jordan is a biracial individual with one black grandparent and three white ones, but was determined by his medical chart to be black and was racialized as black in all of his healthcare interactions, which resulted in a higher estimated EGFR and ultimately delays in his kidney transplant waitlisting versus if he had been considered white. And while this story and others captured the attention of a nation that was watching while the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology uh, deliberated, we are fortunate now uh, that the task force has just released a unified approach in which as equations can estimate the GFR without the race coefficient, but using creatinine and uh, cystatin C instead. And I'll touch on this a little bit 
Uh, but as you all know, nephrology is not the only practice in medicine which has embedded race in a problematic way, uh, not by any intention necessarily, but just because this has never really been interrogated in terms of our pedagogy. Associations with racist ideas about Black individuals' lung capacity that harken back to slavery were embedded into pulmonary function testing, and this is highlighted in this book here by Lundy Braun. Uh, the VBAC uh, is just one of many clinical algorithms which embed a race and ethnicity coefficient for African American and Hispanic individuals. And as many of you all remember, BIDIL is just one example of a race based pharmaceutical practice and race based targeted marketing. But all of this has really mattered to us in kidney disease, in part because kidney disease disparities so starkly reflect. Uh, disparities and inequalities, including structural racism, and this has been described for many decades. One of the most striking realities in kidney disease is this persistent two to four fold higher incidence of end stage kidney disease among black and African American US adults versus white individuals, which has really not diminished much over time. And while we have long sought genetic answers to this egregious disparity, that line of investigation has not yielded clear answers. And furthermore, we've not had a clear explanation to disrupt this disproportionately rapid trajectory of chronic kidney disease among racial and ethnic minorities. For example, Black individuals make up 13% of the US population and constitute 35% of our dialysis population among adults. And this has left us all asking, how can we focus our interventions and investigation on root causes that actually disrupt this trajectory? But as we know, many of our conversations about risk and chronic illness in particular have been positioned around race and racial disparities and comorbidities that are underlying causes of chronic kidney disease like diabetes and hypertension. So look at this graphic of the most common causes of chronic kidney disease in the US, which includes diabetes and hypertension. Nowhere in this graphic is race or racism mentioned but neither are the primary social drivers of diabetes disparities and in outcomes, including housing, medication, and food availability. So when we're asked, is race really the driver of risk? We should be sort of answering that question with, no, race is not the driver of risk, but race is a driver of disproportionate access to key resources. That's really demonstrated nicely here as well uh, in this graph of age-adjusted diabetes prevalence, which demonstrates a disproportionate ongoing burden of disease among Native American, Alaska Native, Black, Hispanic, and Latino individuals. The root cause of this disparity is not a genetic or racial predisposition, but again, rather uh, a social drivers of health, though that often is absent from our conversations. So when we look at this graph uh, but superimposed upon it, the rates of non-insurance for adults in the US, even after the Affordable Care Act, we see that a lot of these uh, persistent disparities in access to care continue to serve as an underlying force driving some of those, again, comorbid risk factors for things like chronic kidney disease. So in short, race drives the social and lived experiences, including resources like insurance. And these contexts need to be named in our discussion of risk with our patients and with our learners as well. And in many ways, our understanding of this concept of root causes of disparity were really catapulted by examining the epidemiology of the COVID-19 pandemic. Although there were numerous early investigations for genetic causes that were explaining some of the disparate morbidity and mortality, uh, further investigation allowed us to see that the disparities in prevalence of disease were really related to testing availability and high density housing and disparities in exposure to COVID because of essential worker status and bias in healthcare. Uh, and fortunately for all of us, you know, these conversations have mapped into the kidney disease space as well. So to dis to just summarize, the disparities that we're talking about are really uh, systematic. They are avoidable. They occur across multiple social domains uh, through which we categorize individuals, including race and ethnicity, religion, skin color, et cetera. And they are often associated with discrimination or marginalization. So what does race have to do with anything and how did it get embedded into our clinical algorithms and, and something as complex as uh, estimating kidney function? So I'm gonna take us through a little bit of history here uh, and 
really a lot of kidney investigation, fortunately, uh, around kidney disease disparities has very correctly identified that the disparities that we see are interrelated and they are uh, really a reflection of disparities in healthcare access by uh, socioeconomic status, et cetera. They are related to disparities in environmental exposures to kidney harming toxins like poor water, uh, lead containing water, et cetera. And also uh, they reflect uh, disparities in comorbidities like I just discussed in hypertension and diabetes. But there has been also a really significant stress on understanding uh, all of the different genetic factors that might also link to kidney disease disparities. And, and for us, that's really uh, involved a lot of discussion around APOL1 high risk alleles and how this might interact with environmental exposures to produce some unique risks. Um, but what's been less clearly articulated in how, is how racial designations play a role in this. And although race has often been positioned as equivalent to a genetic or biologic risk or comorbidity, we know that this is a fallacy and this is a, a problematic way of moving forward with this line of investigation. And in kidney disease, the desire to seek this link between a biological racial truth and disparities has been particularly notable. Um, we have had many transformative discoveries like April 1, which I just mentioned, which shed some light on chronic kidney disease prevalence disparities. This is one of the most notable examples. And here what you see from Crick is this higher proportion of diabetic white patients versus black patients in the April 1 high risk and low risk group who are free from a primary outcome of end-stage kidney disease or 50% reduction in GFR. But as we have learned, even from those studies, race and genetic risk alone have never fully explained racial disparities in end-stage kidney disease incidence or in chronic kidney disease progression. So it leaves us asking, what are we missing? What is the second link hypothesis? And how can we avoid just equating race in a problematic way with the genetic risk? And what I think one of the solutions to that is remembering that race is often poorly defined, poorly contextualized, especially when it's in, described in association with, with uh, risk. And what we need to understand is that race is really not the risk factor again, uh, but it's really how race shapes the resources that we have because of the lived experiences of being a racialized person. This might be the missing link that explains that residual racial disparity from the prior graphic and the second hit hypothesis. And more succinctly put, this is a concept that Dr. Kamara Jones and many other scholars uh, in the last year or two have described as uh, essentially it is racism, not race that is a primary risk factor for multiple diseases that we see. And this is because racism is a feature of our society impacting uh, many facets of our life. And it is a primary risk factor for poor health. So how is race developed and devised? And how did it develop these features that society would pre presumed and science presumed would provide some clear genetic or biologic meaning? In fact, this dates back to the Enlightenment era and uh, the desire for us to categorize species and make sense of species phenotypically. It was initially conceived through this uh, taxonomy where there was a hierarchically uh, categorized grouping of individuals into phenotypically defined groups by these taxons. And Carolus Linnaeus and Blumenbach and many other scientists uh, really embedded some legitimacy into the race concept by weaving it into our scientific discourse. Um, as we know, uh, skin color, eye color, hair type and features and behaviors are often what is used to determine race, but this really doesn't tell us anything about a person's genotype and genetic risk, and I'll talk more about that later. And in fact, even before this year and some of these rigorous conversations about how we talk about race in clinical algorithms, um, and even before for the Human Genome Project. Uh, the UNESCO, for example, uh, issued a report uh, in the 1950s on the race question, and they called into question the legitimacy of this, um, uh, this pseudoscientific claim that there were inherent biological or genetic differences between people in different race categories. And they fundamentally debunked this myth of racial inferiority. Um, the 1950 report even went as far as to say that this myth of race had created an enormous amount of human and social damage. And yet, as, as we all know, it 
took you know, 70 years for us to see big statements from our major scientific societies, et cetera, debunking this myth. Uh, here's an example from the American Association of Physical Anthropologists who wrote that race does not provide an accurate representation of human biological var variation. And they said the Western concept must be understood as a classification system that emerged in, uh, in it from and in support of colonialism, oppression, and discrimination. Um, so, you know, despite this, though, and, uh, you know, the numerous statements from other professional societies, um, this myth persists. Look, at, this is two decades ago, uh, a statement released from uh, now NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins, who wrote that race and ethnicity are flawed surrogates for environmental and genetic factors, including potent, well-described social drivers of health inequality, like healthcare access, income, and education. And yet, uh, again, this is deeply embedded in what we do. And although really deeply painful to look at today, I think it's really important for us to look at how early classification systems around race reflected this mechanism through which racism was perpetuated. Um, this is from Sistema Naturae and uh, shows some of the early categorization schemes which demonstrate this extreme subjectivity and bias and an explicit ordering which placed uh, black individuals and other racial minority and ethnic minority individuals at the bottom of this socio-political hierarchy and white individuals at the top of this hierarchy. Um, and if that isn't enough evidence, I think for all of us in science who are trying to have an objective and rigorous lens of how do we use a measure like race to understand risk, et cetera, all we have to do is look at the US census categories. What you're looking at now is uh, a depiction of how US census categories of race, which we use, as we know, in our NIH and other sponsored studies, has evolved uh, over the last many decades from 1790 to 2010. And this demonstrates, I think beautifully, this socio-political nature of race as an unstable and crude marker, uh, though we continue to use it to understand people's experiences and to quantify, quantify people and groups. So consider, for example, that skin color was used to enumerate people in the 1880s. And in the 1930s, for the first and only time in US history, Mexicans were counted as a race. 1970 marked the first decade post-civil rights legislation that allowed racial categories to actually help us dismantle some unequal policies. But racial categories are continuing to evolve. And in 2000, the first census reflects multiracial identities. And in 2010, the group other becomes the largest racial category uh, in the country, reflecting a growing population of Hispanic and Latinx and multiracial individuals. And all in all, this shows, again, kind of instability of this marker, though we continuously embed this in a lot of our scientific studies. So how does a construct like race get applied to societies and people to ultimately inform their experiences. So I think we learn from social science that racialization refers to a process where a group is defined by their race. And in other countries, this might be based on skin color, based on national origin. Racialized social systems then hierarchically categorize individuals by race. And in the United States, we do this. And this often begins by attributing a meaning to that identity based on skin color and other phenotypic features. And the race that is placed in the uh, greater superior position often receives greater economic remuneration, better jobs, better prospects in the labor market, uh, and more kind of sociopolitical advantages. But how again has this come into science and how have, has this allowed us to continue to kind of embed race within um, the, the uh, context of clinical algorithms, et cetera? This is really upheld by two things that many of us have um, really been subject to, uh, myself included, in terms of how and what I was taught. First, this is this uh, belief around biological determinism. And this is a problematic belief that all of our behaviors are determined by inherited factors, including genes and other attributes that are fully biologically transferred. As we know, we're often influenced by our social experiences. And so this is a bit of a fallacy. And the second problematic uh, thought process that's been involved in this is this idea of race essentialism. And that is the belief that races capture true biological differences with defining core essences. 
Uh, unfortunately, um, this has been associated with racial bias. So individuals who have race essentialist beliefs often have some biased ideas, but it is this that's allowed for categorizations of large biologically and genetically heterogeneous groups of people as the same. So I think what we learn from this is when we are looking at a study and we see race embedded as a variable in it, all of us should be asking ourselves, what are we really measuring with race? Are we actually measuring a person's socioeconomic status? This is a kind of crude marker for that. And there are more precise ways to get at that. Are we measuring ancestry or genetics? The answer is no, and I'll show more about that later. This is an incredibly crude and imprecise measure of that. Are we measuring culture and behavior? Absolutely not, right? There's not, nothing uh, more problematic than thinking that a racial, racial group is fundamentally associated with one culture or one singular behavior. Um, but are we measuring the experiences of racism and discrimination? Perhaps, but we need better ways to precisely get at that. So next I wanna take us into how race essentialism influenced uh, our kidney disease world and how specifically we measure kidney disease in individuals. So it's important to think about this in the context of the evolution of kidney function estimation equations. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this, but give a nice overarching review, hopefully. Um, the national debates about kidney function of estimation in the last year and or two really evolved, really revolved around MDRD and CKD epi. But prior to this, we were operating off of the Cockcroft Galt equation, in which you see no race coefficient embedded. Um, our pediatric colleagues, fortunately, have also avoided this problem with the Schwartz equation, which nowhere includes race uh, in, in the equation. But Cockcroft Galt was fundamentally flawed in part because it was a study of 249 white male veterans. And the goals of the MDRD and CKD epi were really to have a more precise uh, way of measuring kidney fu uh, function using a more diverse population, recognizing that that was not really representative. And they wanted to find an equation that was going to perform better, particularly in older adults and individuals with lower uh, kidney function at baseline, et cetera. Um, but what is key to notice that, that occurred in 1999 and 2009 was this embedding of, again, a race coefficient uh, that uh, conferred a higher EGFR if Black versus all other racial categories. Now, how did this happen in CKD epi? This was an incredibly rigorous study that actually built off of the MDRD equation um, as well. Uh, CKD epi was robust, it was cross-sectional, and it involved several pooled databases to develop and validate kidney function es estimation using exogenous markers to measure GFR. Um, and this estimation of GFR was then compared to population prevalence estimates, and they ran multiple regression on this. Uh, but what was fundamentally probably uh, one of the, the biggest concerns about this is that race was included uh, as an a priori factor that would um, predict kidney function estimation and only black race again was designated as a as a key factor that would distinguish kidney function um, and this was based on the fact that uh, there was a hypothesis that um, muscle mass really was variable and muscle mass determines creatinine generation, but muscle mass varied between black and other individuals. But um, just to kind of kind of debunk that myth, um, there, there were multiple problems with that a priori, uh, a priori notion. First, um, those uh, ideas around muscle mass were never fully validated. Um, many of those early studies that were part of that hypothesis around muscle mass differing had selection bias, used convenience samples, healthy participants. There wasn't a validated analytic tool for understanding this. And so um, what we ended up with uh, is a complete interrogation of this and, and an opportunity to reflect on really what we're measuring with kidney function. First, right, we know serum creatinine is inversely related to GFR. Creatinine, though, is problematic in many ways as a, a, a singular um, way of measuring kidney function. First, um, we have problems uh, using this to estimate kidney uh, function in the setting of acute kidney injury. Um, this 
EFR, EGFR, estimated GFR is really just an estimate um, and uh, doesn't allow us to incorporate key factors like albuminuria as a uh, essential marker for prognosticating our patient's kidney function. And there's a huge amount of variability with diet and muscle mass and medications and tubular secretion that are, um, you know, uh, problematic when using creatinine as a sole uh, marker to embed into a kidney function estimation equation. And yet, as we know, EGFR is, has been a key component of our, of our educational materials aimed to enhance our patient knowledge and awareness. Uh, this has been key as well in our surveillance efforts. And I want to show you from a patient-facing kind of standpoint, this is pre-change uh, pre to the GFR. So the National Kidney Foundation website no longer has this on it, but prior to that change, what you see here is kind of this reinforcement of the race coefficient and this idea of racial differences in biology and kidney function. So this uh, picture demonstrates how three individuals with the same exact serum creatinine would have had substantially different GFRs, CKD stages, and are probably given very different attention to that issue in a clinical setting primarily in a primary care clinical setting. And it's unclear whether all three of them would have, let's say, had a microalbuminuria assessment or some other assessment or even a urinalysis. And what the last two years of interrogation and, and kind of experimentation with this idea of what happens with and without the race coefficient have taught us is that the removal of the race coefficient has had, ha, would have an enormous impact on surveillance. So this is a cross-sectional study using NHANES data and VA data from adults older than 20 years old who had a serum creatinine and race data available. And removal of the black race coefficient from CKD epi was associated with a substantial increase in the estimated prevalence of chronic kidney disease among US black adults and among US black veterans. So we're talking about nearly uh, 1 million more uh, diagnoses of individuals with with CKD3 or higher, and nearly 100,000 new diagnoses of Black adult veterans with CKD3 or higher. And as we know, this is uh, really significant in terms of what this means for, let's say, a primary care provider and thoughts about referral to nephrology care, assessment of albuminuria and proteinuria, consideration of optimal therapies for blood pressure control and SGLT2 inhibitors. So here's another way of looking at this, right? We're talking about potential a hundred, uh, uh, nearly a million new individuals where we should be thinking about RAS inhibition, SGLT2 inhibition use, um, and then almost 68,000 uh, individuals who would have had a new GFR less than 30 who would have been eligible uh, or needing uh, ed education about kidney replacement therapy and discussions about things like living donor kidney transplantation. Um, this uh, really important interrogation of the race coefficient also yielded some important findings around transplantation specifically. This is a study by Zelnick et al. and looked at the accuracy of the racialized CKD epi equation and its contributions to transplant inequities for Black individuals, and they showed that removal of the coefficient would result in reaching the transplant listing threshold 1.9 years sooner uh, for Black individuals uh, and 52% uh, higher risk of achieving an EGFR less than 30, which I mentioned again is kind of that threshold for kidney transplant education, et cetera. So all in all, uh, even the original authors of the equation, I think, uh, allowed our field to lead uh, in medicine by saying we need to do something better than this. Um, although it was initially hypothesized that differences in muscle mass were explanatory factors, this has not been shown to explain ob observed differences uh, in serum creatinine between black individuals and others. And we need to continue to seek an evidence-based truth. Um, I would encourage everybody now to go to the National Kidney Foundation and, and utilize and have patients utilize the new EGFR calculators, which allow individuals to understand also the importance of things like albuminuria assessment and kidney function. Um, want to shift gears a little bit now to talking about how racism in other ways has to do with kidney health as well. Um, 
And really, uh, this begins by us understanding that racism is a system of power that delineates differential value resources and opportunities to individuals based on their racialized social status. It is also a primary mechanism through which racial and other inequities are generated. Um, as many of us have learned in the last couple of years, there are really multiple ways in which racism operates. Uh, it operates at an individual level in terms of our stereotypes and our biases about groups of individuals. It operates sometimes interpersonally, including uh, in the way that we interact with individuals in a clinical setting. Uh, it, it, it impacts us from a cultural standpoint in terms of the kinds of reflection, sometimes negative, that we see represented in the media about whole groups of individuals. Um, and, and it also can manifest structurally and institutionally. Structural or institutionalized racism really refers to the ways in which racialized differential access to resources and opportunities and services are codified into our law, into our policy, into our practices and norms, so that there's often never a single identifiable perpetrator, but there is a problem. Um, a great example of uh, an economic or environmental justice uh, kind of manifestation of racism was the Flint, Michigan water crisis. We know that there is targeted marketing of health harming products like tobacco and alcohol in neighborhoods that are predominantly um, of individuals who are minority, racial and ethnic minorities. We know about the historic impacts of redlining and I'll talk about some of that in a bit. Uh, and we know about ongoing inequities in healthcare access and delivery that occur uh, because of race. And within uh, the medical system, um, we know that there is uh, a, an ongoing kind of issue with what some folks have called everyday racism, which is this kind of everyday prejudice and discrimination that can follow us along. And we can actually see this very clearly sometimes in our medical records where stigma laden messaging about people may carry through a person's chart over decades. Um, this has been really well described in the context of pain management and pain treatment. Um, exposure to stigmatizing notes have been associated with more negative attitudes toward our patients. And reading those notes has been associated with less aggressive pain management, et cetera. Um, and a really beautiful study was uh, done and, and published in uh, the Journal of General Internal Medicine, which kind of showed that those negative portrayals using irrelevant and unnecessary data that don't really describe what's going on in a patient's life can carry implications around that person's irresponsibility, et cetera, and really impact provider behavior. And things as simple as a linguistic variation, for example, using the term narcotic in one patient's a chart versus the term opiate have a huge impact. So this is one arena where we can really try to think clearly about the way that we're communicating about the people that we care for. Another example of, of everyday racism that might influence health is this suspicion. So being followed around um, security alerts in hospitals around certain groups of people and, and racial profiling. We saw the COVID-19 pandemic really highlight this problem of scapegoating, blaming a whole group of, uh, of, of individuals for a problem. Um, and, and this, of course, we saw most notably with bias and racism toward the Asian American community in terms of COVID-19. And racism has also manifested in perhaps its most extreme forms historically and in the present day as dehumanization from forced sterilization abuses and eugenics, which has occurred in the state of Virginia and the state of North Carolina, to other forms of medical experimentation and police brutality. These are all examples of the types of things that we also in medicine have a responsibility to tackle. So what are the impacts of this on kidney health? There have fortunately been several studies that have really highlighted this, but one of the ways in which this might impact kidney health is through the accumulation of stressors over time. So the stress of contending with racism, which may be uh, captured in a measure like the allostatic load is conceptualized in something called weathering. And this theory helps us understand how uh, over time, uh, essentially uh, individuals who are constantly experiencing um, discrimination 
um, may have a, a greater allostatic load over time uh, versus counterparts who are not kind of contending with that ongoing adversity. Um, this is using NHANES data and demonstrates uh, on the uh, y-axis the probability of having a higher allostatic load is higher among uh, Black individuals above and below a certain poverty threshold versus white individuals. And uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Joseph Luniera, extended some of this work to the kidney space, examined the association between cumulative lifetime socioeconomic status and chronic kidney disease in Black Americans using the Jackson Heart Study, um, and showed that lower cumulative uh, lifetime socioeconomic status was associated with CKD prevalence and modestly with CKD incidence uh, and EGFR decline. And this was through the mechanism of that allostatic load. But it's also um, really important to understand how some of the well-described disparities in kidney disease have root causes that have a very strong evidence base linked to structural and interpersonal racism. Um, consider, for example, uh, the fact that uh, there's a greater mortality that has been noted among young black versus white individuals with CKD. And uh, really, when you dig deep into the literature, you recognize that uh, there's some 10% excess risk of chronic kidney disease that has been attributed to a lack of usual sources of care. We know um, in work that just came out this last year, there is still uh, persistent delays in referral to nephrology care and less pre-dialysis kidney care among all racial and ethnic uh, minority groups in the United States. And when you dive deep again, uh, there is um, there has been very clear studies demonstrating that racial residential segregation has been associated with a less likelihood of receiving pre-dialysis care. So where you live really matters in terms of the access to resources and things like specialty care that people can uh, have. And in dialysis, the, the same patterns uh, persist. There is a higher mortality among young black versus white individuals receiving dialysis. Um, and this has also, uh, and including poor quality dialysis has been linked to neighborhood composition and the kinds of resources that are in certain, again, racial and ethnic minority neighborhoods versus others. Um, the same patterns have been shown in terms of uh, the, the less likelihood of receiving home dialysis modalities. And in fact, uh, upon examination of dialysis units, um, many dialysis units that are primarily serving racial and ethnic minorities have less offering of those opportunities to those patients. So we have quite a bit of work to do. But nowhere in kidney disease are these disparities more obvious than in transplant, unfortunately. Um, this uh, 2000 study was a landmark study uh, that demonstrated that among individuals who are appropriate for transplant, Black individuals were less likely to be referred for evaluation, placed on the wait list, or complete transplant compared to their white counterparts. And we're talking about a difference of 52% versus 69% for completion of transplantation. Unfortunately, in the last two decades, though we've made some progress in this arena, there are other arenas where uh, things have only gotten worse, I, uh, unfortunately. And um, one of those arenas is in living donor kidney transplantation. Um, those disparities have only widened over time. And what we are contending with is still some persistent uh, disparities in waitlist times, referral rates, completed evaluations, uh, disparities in the receipt of transplant education, specifically around living donor kidney transplantation, ongoing disparities in pre-dialysis care and preemptive transplantation, um, and, and uh, really gaps that we need to continue to fill in terms of provider and staff knowledge of racial disparities and their causes. Many uh, investigators have tried to understand this and have really leaned on um, this understanding of, of mistrust as a, of a, as a maybe root cause of this. But we know that mistrust doesn't exist in a vacuum and is often influenced by people's experiences of discrimination, et cetera. Uh, and this was really highlighted nicely in a study uh, also from the Southeast, um, looking at associations between mistrust, racism, and initiation of a transplant eval um, in Georgia. Uh, which found that mistrust and prior discrimination were associated with a lower transplant evaluation initiation uh, among this cohort. So uh, I want to leave us with how else are racialized forces impacting kidney health? Um, it, we, we honestly have 
a kind of an ongoing uh, onslaught of information overload demonstrating that there are enormous regional disparities in kidney disease. And you see that highlighted here. Um, a lot of this has to do with income and socioeconomic status. So we know that low income is associated with higher mortality uh, among individuals with um, dialysis. And that is regardless uh, um, of, of race, but more potent for black individuals versus others. We know that diet and the access to healthy food has a huge impact on chronic kidney disease. And things like food insecurity have been associated with end-stage kidney disease risk. Low income has been associated with poor uh, uh, outcomes, including elevated phosphorus, for example. And we also know that food deserts um, continue to uh, persist in primarily racial minority and economically disadvantaged neighborhoods. This is uh, from work in uh, Chicago that demonstrate that despite overall improvements in the food landscape, these historically uh, redlined uh, neighborhoods in Chicago have continued to be sort of food deserts. So these things really matter. And what about the role of neighborhoods? I, I just kind of demonstrated that um, you know, poverty has, a, has a, a significant association with end-stage kidney disease. And we see this demonstrated time and time again with more potent effects, again, for black versus white uh, individuals. Um, neighborhood socioeconomic status here we see uh, has a huge impact on um, the survival of uh, individuals with uh, worse survival among young black versus white dialysis patients. And when we do kind of a deeper dive into what is going on, um, it's kind of taking us back to that concept that I was talking about in the middle. What are the racialized practices that got us to a place where our neighborhoods are so different? Um, what you're looking at on the left-hand side is the formerly redlined map of Durham, uh, North Carolina, where I live. Uh, in 1937, the Federal Housing and Lending Corporation redlined Durham and a lot of other cities uh, using these color-coded maps that rated neighborhoods based on the risk of lending. Uh, green were determined to be safest, followed by blue, yellow, and red, uh, which were the riskiest. And the presence of uh, Black individuals or immigrants and poor people uh, were considered the biggest race, uh, risk factors. And what ultimately happened is exclusionary zoning and uh, disinvestment in the infrastructure and resources in many of those neighborhoods, including in healthcare. Uh, and this is just an example of that from Durham, where um, up uh, uh, until desegregation, there were even completely segregated healthcare resources. Um, just as further evidence of that, here's this is from Durham, uh, some examples of racial covenants, which very clearly state uh, that, uh, for example, only white individuals can live in certain neighborhoods. Um, what did this do over time in terms of wealth inequality? Uh, well, uh, over time, um, the, you know, neighborhoods in primarily white neighborhoods uh, have increased in value substantially more than neighborhoods of color. Um, we wanted to take these concepts and apply them to an understanding of kidney disease in Durham, which we thought was a, a, a really uh, unique place to look at this because it is uh, rapidly growing uh, like uh, Richmond and um, incredibly diverse and with uh, numerous pockets of rapid gentrification as well. Um, and what you see, it, uh, what you're looking at now is two different neighborhoods. Uh, the one on the left, a historically red line neighborhood versus the one on the right, Watts Hillendale, which was in the green zone before. These enormous income disparities persist um, almost fourfold with enormous disparities as well in the built environment in those neighborhoods. Uh, we further tried to understand the association between chronic kidney disease and these manifestations uh, in, in Durham and looked at a couple of different um, variables that reflect structural racism. So specifically uh, voting patterns, eviction patterns, uh, the built environment, policing, et cetera. And we used uh, data from our patients from the whole Duke Health System and our federally qualified health center and uh, tried to understand neighborhood by neighborhood chronic kidney disease prevalence. And we linked that data to some of this other socio-contextual data. And what you see here is just a kind of a, a, a map example of that. So the, the neighborhoods in which 
the greatest uh, prevalence of CKD uh, exists are the same neighborhoods where there is a burden of evictions, where there is some of the uh, most substantial degrees of poverty uh, and the most substantial degrees of kind of criminalization. And when we looked at, uh, again, kind of differences in these neighborhoods based on CKD prevalence, uh, you're looking at uh, populations and, and neighborhoods that are uh, incredibly different between these neighborhoods. So again, um, neighborhoods with higher CKD prevalence have a disproportionately higher percentage of Hispanic and African American individuals and, and more sort of um, concerning other features, including poverty. So uh, almost half of the median household income in those high CKD prevalence neighborhoods versus low. And in regression analyses, we found that, uh, not surprisingly, um, in adjusted models, living in a neighborhood with above median long commute times um, and above uh, median, uh, median household income was associated uh, with um, lower CKD prevalence overall. So what lessons do we, can we apply uh, about race to kidney health? I think the first thing, uh, it, just going back to the beginning of this talk, is remembering that within population differences account for the bulk of genetic variation. Um, differences among major groups make up about only 3 to 5% of differences. And this figure here um, shows in the Venn diagram how among three renowned scientists, Dr. Kim has more allelic commonality with Dr. Watson and Dr. Venter than Dr. Watson and Venter have with each other. Uh, yet this messaging that race is biology is deep and longstanding. And look at this 1947 JAMA article, sickle cell disease is described as race specific. But almost 10 years ago, uh, scientists demonstrated a strong geographical link between the highest hemoglobin uh, S frequency and high malaria endemicity, demonstrating how it's geography and evolutionary adaptation and not race that explains something even like sickle cell anemia and the epidemiology of that. So we should really apply this to the context of kidney disease and start to understand that even things like high risk genetic variants, including APOL1, are distributed across geography. They don't map neatly onto races or continents. And, and this is demonstrated nicely here. These variants are distributed across the globe, including variably in the African continent and throughout other parts of the world. What is implications does this have on a, a global scale? If by race we're talking about uh, uh, people with a, a similar genetic link, we're not hitting the mark. Um, this is a, a study that demonstrated that in sub-Saharan Africa, the bias associated with using the black race coefficient uh, from CKD epi actually uh, worsened uh, with the use of the race coefficient in those contexts. And similar data uh, exists from Brazil and other parts of the globe. So what is the, what is the future of, um, uh, of kind of kidney health research and how do we achieve equity and justice in the work that we do? I really love this paper from Health Affairs this year, uh, which kind of sums up the urgency of dismantling racism and calls us to do three things very clearly. And that is first, define race and specify the reasons for its use, whether we're doing that uh, in our clinical encounters when we're meeting patients and describing a new patient case, or when we're embedding race as a variable into our clinical studies. We need to continue to name uh, and examine the role of racism in producing health inequities and producing those enormous resource uh, inequities that I have demonstrated now. Um, and then we need to move beyond these systems that perpetuate this erroneous association between race and genetics, pushing instead for an evidence-based ideal and really getting precise about things like genetic risk if that's what we're trying to understand. Um, the next thing is uh, recognizing that the status quo is unacceptable. Um, equality isn't even enough uh, because that hasn't gotten us to the ideal that we seek. And equity really requires tailoring support and resources and other interventions to address the unique needs of systematically marginalized group, uh, groups. Um, a justice paradigm would even remove the barriers to equity in health outcomes that we seek. 
And finally, structural competency. This is this idea that allows us to uh, understand that uh, kidney harming environments may impact disease expression. And so what we often see at the surface of, a, of an iceberg are these inequalities that are manifest as disparities in housing, et cetera. Um, but below that, kind of the, the disparities that we see in, in rates of kidney disease, et cetera, um, are all of these policies and um, kind of political structures that we do need to interrogate and disrupt. And, and finally, um, even though I've talked about race as being highly problematic, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, include race, right? So race or colorblind approaches are based in this idea that race is irrelevant and treating everyone equally has equal equality, but we know that this is very much far from the truth. Uh, and one example of, of where uh, kind of the omission of race led us to more problems was in the early periods of COVID vaccine distribution. So without data about race and ethnicity that is self-reported, we uh, had problems allocating resources appropriately. And uh, therefore, you know, it, it's important to kind of continue to recognize how the experience of being a person who is racialized in the U.S. shapes your experiences with health and shapes your uh, access to care, et cetera. And finally, centering at the margins. This is this concept that our patients' voices, and particularly the voices of socially marginalized individuals, should be the central axis around which our interventions and discourse revolves. I think this was has been so beautifully highlighted by uh, work in the kidney space by uh, uh, Dr. Cervantes, who essentially um, showcased the real life experiences of uh, undocumented folks in the state of Colorado who were experiencing emergency only dialysis, the heartbreak, the strain, the morbidity, the stress on the providers, et cetera. She, she qualitatively documented that work, um, which got uh, national attention in CNN and then attention in our journals and really allowed that to elevate major policy changes, including a shift in the uh, Medicaid coverage for undocumented folks in the state of Colorado. So to sum up, um, moving forward, we should strive to define and contextualize race, racism, and other social domain markers, remembering that the risk for disease or poor outcomes is racism and not race. Um, we should try to enhance trustworthiness, uh, and that involves, you know, kind of dismantling the barriers to trustworthiness in the care that we provide, making sure that patients and community stakeholders are part of our research, are uh, have key voices in structuring and guiding the research and even guiding the questions that we ask, centering our patients' expertise in our studies. Um, we should invest in partnerships with community-based organizations and community-facing organizations that care for individuals with kidney disease, particularly um, a lot of uh, the community uh, community-based organizations serving uh, racial and ethnic minorities. We should continue to promote rigorous investigation through funding mechanisms and invest in structural solutions. Um, from the perspective of education, um, our medical education should uh, continue to strive to embed this structural competency as a core competency and ensure that our learners are kind of disrupting this old pedagogy of race equals genetics. Uh, and we should ensure that our training environments themselves are free from bias and discrimination. And finally, um, embedding anti-racist practice into CME. So ensuring that some of, our, of, of these principles are part of uh, continuing medical education. Uh, and finally, um, we should embed this equity lens uh, when we're thinking about everything that we do. I think about this in transplant a lot. So when you're thinking about the best candidate for a kidney transplant, really interrogating things like adherence and social support, um, trying to better understand how we can overcome some of those barriers, uh, in, investing again in structural solutions. So policy changes for things like dialysis reimbursement, et cetera. Um, and then embedding anti-racism into our care systems. I think, uh, again, the best example of this from the last year was the National Kidney Foundation and ASN coming together to interrogate the use of the race coefficient in kidney function estimation. Um, I wanna leave some time for questions, so I'll go ahead and close with that um, and stop sharing, but thank you all so much and happy to answer any questions at all. Thank you. Um, 
very profound presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate that. I have a few questions, but I'd like to pause and see what the audience members uh, have. Again, you can use the chat function, Q&A, or um, just raise your hand. We can unmute you and you can ask your question. All right, I, I think I'll start uh, just in the interest of time. We have about five minutes. I think, um, so uh, thank you so much. We had a presentation earlier this year by uh, Dr. Clyde Yancey up at Northwestern um, talking about COVID disparities. And he also brought up the Chicago neighborhood and redlining and how inequalities have persisted through the last 80 years since the New Deal. Um, my question is, is more, you know, I think when we think about the approach to uh, race, racism, structural racism and medicine, one of the challenges uh, as an everyday clinician, um, I just wanted to, if you, uh, if you don't mind uh, putting your PowerPoint back up, I just wanted to highlight, um, you said, you know, what can we do? And you said, be a very uh, define the race and make sure that you're specified the reason for using that. And just as everyday clinicians, we here at VCU are uh, in the middle of an epic um, EHR transformation. And oftentimes race may be mentioned in clinical notes, case conferences and things like that. Just wondered if you could expand on that point a little bit um, and um, how the, the word that the attending uses may reflect on learners in our environment. Thanks. Yeah, wonderful question. Thank you for that. Um, this is, I think this is very difficult, right? And I think the, the first thing uh, from an EHR standpoint that is actionable is uh, ensuring that um, essentially what is, so there's first, I'll, I'll kind of take a step back and say, there's been a number of studies that have demonstrated that the race that is marked in a patient's chart may not accurately reflect their self-identified race. And that is because that uh, determination is occurring, for example, at the time of check-in, et cetera. So I think one, one uh, place where we can potentially make some impact is just ensuring that uh, front desk staff and other kind of key individuals involved uh, in the administrative side of things are doing that in a way that is true to a person's self-identity. It's just like uh, the incorporation of sex and gender uh, variables into EPIC, right, which is now an NIH standard that you are putting your own gender pronouns in, et cetera, et cetera. The same thing I think can be said about race and ethnicity, ensuring that there is uh, a, a clear discussion with the patient about that um, because of the influence that it has on, on all of these things, including the race coefficient, for example, in kidney function estimation. Um, the second question, I think, uh, in terms of how to engage around this with learners, oh, this is, a, this is such a wonderful question. And I, um, I think that the honest answer is uh, if, if a patient's race is being used to um, Anytime we're using a patient's race in the medical chart or during a discussion of a patient's case uh, with colleagues, I think asking ourselves why we are putting that uh, that there is is really kind of fundamentally essential, right? And so it's not saying that it's categorically right or wrong. It's just being sure that we think to ourselves, why did I just say this is a white patient XYZ? This is a Latinx patient XYZ. Is that to describe the experiences that they may have in the world as a person who self-describes as that race? Is that to suggest something about their genetic risk? Is that to suggest something about their behavior? Because if that's the case, that's uh, problematic, right? And so it's. I think it's really really uh, trying to get clear about why we're disseminating information in that way and making it clear to our learners um, that we're, we're trying to, um, you know, avoid these highly problematic kind of first stereotypes and other kind of biases, um, but really trying to dig deep into um, some of the, again, unique 
structural and other barriers that a person may experience because of their uh, race or ethnicity in terms of their experience going around um, the world. Thank you so much. I think there's one more question here in the chat box. Um, one thing that we run into in transplant is access to care and consistency in medications and monitoring methods, often secondary to social structures. Do you have any comments about technology access as a method of helping patients manage care collaboratively with providers? Yeah, that's a that's a great um, great question as well. So I think this is where um, our kind of role as uh, you know patient, physician advocates can kind of come into play, um, recognizing that things like advocating for universal broadband access, ensuring that you know our patients can have things like uh, internet access so they can be on my chart and be on some of these other kind of telehealth interventions um, to increase access. I, I do think it's part of our role to you know kind of to continue to advocate for those kinds of changes um, to reduce some of the huge structural barriers, particularly when we're talking about rurality um, as at the on the you know on the VA side of things where I I primarily do my care, it has been really important in this last year and a half uh, for us to do everything we can to expand telephone and video help, video access, particularly for folks who are three, four, five hours away. And so I think um, continuing to advocate for those changes is, is one huge way of kind of tackling structural um, barriers. Uh, the second thing is, is from the transplant side of things, um, you know, continuing to advocate for uh, shifts in um, access to the resources that we know are essential for things like adherence. So, um, you know, again, uh, medication access, the fact that SGLT2 inhibitors cost as much as they do, you know, I'm fortunate at the VA, I can get them for my patients, but the fact that there are still racial uh, disparities in prescribing and access to those medications is problematic. And I think we have a role to advocate uh, to ensure that those barriers are reduced. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any other questions right now, and, um, and we are a few minutes over, but I want to um, thank you so much for the presentation. We really appreciate that. And just a reminder to everyone that the presentation, uh, the recording will be available online. Um, and I'm sure uh, that we can reach out to Dr. Montague if there are questions that come up or follow up things. So please um, keep that in mind. But thank you so much for a wonderful, inspiring and profound presentation today. Um, thank you for highlighting this issue. Thank you so much. You take care. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. The CME code is in the chat if anybody needs it. Um, and so uh, it will be up and the QR code should be up on your screen now if you need to record your attendance. Thanks a lot, everyone. We'll leave the chat room open for just one or two more minutes. Uh, thanks for your time.